Welcome, hey welcome to the, to the podcast Bitcoin show by show Kiva Navani, um, the Total Connector, I'm really excited to Total have Bitcoin, Emil Sunset, awesome economics. Him. He's really the a hardest, a profound, and scarcest uh, money ever created uh, in knowledgeable um, Bitcoin and educated uh, Bitcoiner when it comes to you know the fundamentals of Bitcoin, monetary properties, and especially you know his book just came out. Uh, it's called Money Dethroned, a historical journey. You should uh, definitely check out also his Twitter threads, Twitter posts. Um, and yeah, let me know what you think afterwards. I'm really looking forward to that talk. And uh, it's really important for the sake of education, for the sake of comprehension to, you know, before we go into action, before we, you know, expect people to go into action and, uh, and carry with us this evol monetary evolution, it's the understanding, you know, the, uh, the learning out of history that, you know, it's nothing new, debasement of money, inflation, uh, you know, the, the uh, fucking up the money is not something new. It's been going on for, for such a long with its metallurgy, metal money or whatever, paper money, uh, every culture, every, every you know, um, historical event, uh, you can go back. And so I think the art and the challenge is to learn out of this and, and understand you know, how is inflation, how is the basement really created? And yeah, so let me know what you think afterwards and write me an email to hello at the totalconnect.com or follow me on Twitter, subscribe, share, follow, and thanks so much for support and for listening. And without further ado, this is my talk with Emil Sunstead. Hey Emil, how are you doing? Hey. Thank you so much for coming to my show again. Thank you very much, Kevin, for inviting me again. It's a pleasure to be here. It's always great to have you because you have a really profound knowledge. You just published uh, your new book. Congratulations to that. Uh, it's called, yeah. it's, I mean, it, I love the title, <laughs> uh, Money Dethroned, A Historical Journey. So you can get it on uh, Amazon, right? On Amazon, that's correct, as an ebook or as a paperback. Yeah, there it is. But right now it's on as Kindle version, but but the paper version is going to come. The print version. The paper version is there, so you have to click on my name there. Um, I oh, guess I they you. will link automatically in the future, but I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so there you go. Wonderful. So, um, so listen. Uh, first of all, um, just an anecdote. Uh, somebody on Twitter. I guess you know him by his Twitter handle Arbidu <laughs> or Abedal Arbidu. Yeah, I follow him. <laughs> Yeah, so it's so funny. He, he published, um, uh, so he, he tweeted um, the, the new books of Ben Bernanke. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, it's meant, of course, cynical, but he, 2017, he published Bernan Bernanke's book, The Courage to Act. <clears throat> mm -hmm. 2019, Bernanke's book, Firefighting, <laughs> The Financial Crisis and Its Lessons Published. And then in 2020 now, Bernanke's book, First Responders Inside the U.S. Strategy, for fighting a global financial crisis. I mean, isn't Except that- He's a real hero, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, isn't, that, isn't it funny? The, the very same people, the very same entities who commit arson are put into charge of the one of the most fundamental decision-making processes when it comes to money. money. Uh, and uh, well, you know, it's like, uh, you know, giving the arsonists uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, likely they don't see themselves, of course, as arsonists. They, they see themselves as saviors because many of these uh, mainstream economists see themselves as better. Uh, they, they need to fix stuff that isn't broken. Um, that's their shtick. <laughs> so, Emil, um, can you, let's, let's have a first, uh, you know, a, like a zoom out, have a bigger picture. What are you trying to make? your readers, your potential mm. readers, everybody's just following you or reading your books, trying to make them understand, comprehend with your mm. book. So the book, Money Dethroned, it's, uh, as you hear, it's about money. And uh, as Bitcoiners, we talk about money all the time. And I was writing all these articles last year about, uh, they're called Tales of Soft Money, and they follow all these uh, examples of primitive monies that once were money, but and now we can't use them as money anymore. So they got demonetized or de dethroned, if you will. Um, I, I started out with all these articles. And after a while, I had a dinner with a friend in the city. And he, we were talking about money, about Bitcoin. He's not a Bitcoiner, but he's interested in money. 
and he said, yeah, you should write, write a book about it. And uh, I decided, yeah, why not? I have a lot of articles, I have a lot of material. So, so why not? It's a good way to consolidate all the knowledge in, in one place. So what I did with Money Dethroned, half of the book is uh, more or less about these instances of primitive monies. And I think by now, Bitcoiners are rather good at understanding, for example, the properties of hardness, stock to flow ratios, what properties makes money good, what makes money bad. So this first half of the book, I think most Bitcoiners are really, really good at understanding the dynamics of place. The Austin economics, uh, how many monies become one after a while, relative, relative saleableness and all this. But one, th one thing that was rather new for me, or what I thought about, and that I added in the second half of the book that we can go, go to already, it's the, um, it deals with the basements and general tinkering of money. And this, I think, is the next step for many people involved with Bitcoin or that likes to think about money. This is the next step to think about in terms of how to defend Bitcoin's hardness or how to how to uh, think about money in general because we all understand that money will have uh, in the end you know infinite stock to flow that's great what I did in the second half of uh, money dethroned is that I, I started with one uh, real example of uh, it's a Tunisian merchant in 14th century uh, North Africa he's on this journey east towards Mecca he's very rich he is carrying a lot of uh, gold dinars and due to the summer heat, he sadly passes away there uh, on the journey. So he, he left his gold dinars to a friend in, in the caravan. The Tunisian government, the authorities, they, got, uh, they heard about this event. So they quickly confiscated all the gold from this, uh, this merchant. So no gold ever reached his descendants in Tunis. So I think this is a good example of even though he had the hardest money in the world, gold, it didn't help him in the end when it was confiscated. <clears throat> so this dynamic, it's what I'm, I'm trying to emphasize in the second half of the book, that even though Bitcoin is extremely hard, it will soon be harder than gold. We have to continue to think about how to defend the hardness. Uh, and this example with the Tunisian merchant, it's, it's only one example. You have, of course, much more common examples of uh, powerful states debasing the money. They are um, putting silver in the, in the gold coins, they put the copper in the silver coins, they shrink the size, they shrink the weight, they change the shapes of the money, they change the face values of the money and all this. And bear in mind that this is all done on, for example, gold, world's hardest money. So with the powerful states, they can still exercise considerable harm to people that hold hard money. And so this is what makes the second part of the book very relevant for Bitcoin in my opinion, that it, it teaches us all these various examples how gold was attacked. And we can extrapolate that and apply it to Bitcoin. Like how, how can we resist similar attacks to Bitcoin? But is it possible? Uh, let, me, let me ask you, is it really, can you, can you extrapolate it? Can you really compare you know, the historical hardness of gold and the risks and the, you know, um, didn't want to interrupt your flow, you know, but, but mm. is, is, it, is it on the same level? I mean... I think it's possible for various reasons. For example, debasements. Debasements is uh, akin to adding more supply to the money. Um, with Bitcoin, what, what I was going to come to, our best defense with Bitcoin and our best defense of Bitcoin's hardness is the ability to run full nodes. Mm -hmm. This is something that many are emphasizing on Twitter, for example. And I, I think uh, it's generally understated. People tend to focus more on these stock to flow models, for example. And it's very nice, of course, to have a really high stock to flow. And I love it as well. But we have to be able to very simply run full nodes. They have to. They have, they have to fit in a laptop, for example, because with, with a full node, we can, assess, um, we can assess Bitcoin every day. We can see that no one has exercised the basement on it. We can see that no one exercised various uh, tinkering on Bitcoin. Uh, and we, we can keep our Bitcoin pure. 
by always running a full node so we know which economic rules we are running or we adhere to and directly self-validating every transaction right and yeah and yeah. seeing it for your, with your own eyes right exactly so so this is i think it's a valid comparison to gold because gold was it was very costly to assess if you have a, if you're a merchant and you are getting a, you receive a gold coin it was not always the case that they even had the technology to judge how much gold is really in this coin the basements were often exercised with for example one two three percent silver content added every time and you can't see such a small gradual shift in uh, in the basement <clears throat> so people were constantly defrauded by the authorities while we who run bitcoin full nodes we can't be constantly defrauded because we validate we validate everything <clears throat> so in a sense bitcoin will be harder than gold but it is already much easier to assess than gold so we are already escaping a lot of costs that these uh, guys using gold and silver they couldn't escape these costs um, and for me it was very interesting to kind of stumble upon uh, the next step if you, you realize Bitcoin is hard, you, you move on to the next step and realize that, yeah, Bitcoin is hard and we can enforce the economic rules ourselves. We can always assess the, the quality of the Bitcoin that we own. You know what's fascinating with your, um, with your um, um, explanations and uh, historical analysis is that it's a repetitive debasement. It's like, you know, I had a teacher once, I had an English and historical teacher in, in school, and he said, it would be too good to be true um, if, if, if we as humanity or people, you know, could learn something out of history. I mean, I don't li literally agree with him, but, <clears throat> but I do understand, I, I understood his point he was trying to make. Mm -hmm. But when you, you know, when you, like uh, when you explain all these debasements that have been going on for so for such a long time, you know, like even thousands of years, <laughs> at least hundreds of years and hundreds and hundreds of years, um, is that it, it, you can find it in literally in every culture, right? Yeah, yeah. You can find it in uh, almost everywhere, these debasements, and they come in various shapes and forms also. So they're not, you know, Naively, you would think that the, the basements, it's just an order from the authorities, hand in the silver, we're going to give you back the same amount of coins, but you will get 5% less silver content, for example. But the way they did the basements, they came in so many sh shapes and forms. Um, and it could be, can be good to know all of this. You know that they change the sizes, uh, even happy events, they, they, they make into something bad. Like, for example, one example in my book is when the Byzantine army reconquers uh, their capital, um, Constantinople. Of course, this has to be celebrated, and uh, the emperor want to uh, issue new coins to celebrate this. Uh, and what, what does he do with the new coin? He debases them. Uh, so, so the populace just give, gives him the, the money, he takes it, he, he takes a lot of gold from it, and then he restamps the money in, and give, give it back. So they have tried all kinds of trickery to get money and it always has worked um, but it doesn't work anymore bitcoin is resisting this seniorage the the, the difference between the cost to produce the money and the value of the money so suddenly the state the, the state can't put the tax in the seniorage anymore it can shift the tax towards other it can increase the for example sales tax or income tax or or corporate tax, which is pretty popular these days to be angry about corporations, but it can't put the tax on the money anymore with Bitcoin, which I see as a big win. Right, right. So, um, can we talk about, um, you know, it's, it's it really, I think it's really, really important to understand uh, the, let's just say, let's just call it the Austrian economical perspectives and, uh, you know, the monetary properties uh, what makes what makes a money? What are the what are really uh, you know good monetary properties? But when we talk about you know the structures that we have been uh, you know born into <laughs> for, for at least a hundred years now uh, with the central banks, do you want to comment a little bit about this the legitimacy of the central bank? I don't. I know it's not part of your book. I, I get mm -hmm. that, but 
but I always come to the same conclusion. It's like, where does the central bank or the central bank or all central banks, the bank for international settlements and the whole, the total centralized structures that surround it, the puppets, bureaucrats, technocrats, agents, decision makers, where do they derive their legitimacy? But I don't think they have, they don't have legitimacy. They, they have power because, mm -hmm. yeah, because they have power. And one thing, my book is written, the historical yarn is about medieval events. It's often about medieval uh, historical accounts. What the emperors and kings and sultans back then were doing with money, it was always a bit difficult for them. They had to lure people to, to give the gold and silver so that they could debase, debase it. In some really harsh uh, rulers, they forced people to come with uh, the precious metal. Otherwise, you, were, you, you would get killed. But in general, it was difficult. And nowadays, with the central banks, it's not di even difficult anymore. They have all the power. So if they want to debase, they will debase. Um, so in a sense, it's even worse today than it was during the worst times in the Middle Ages. So this is an interesting situation. And I think people are generally accept they accept the central bank because these really disastrous events, they, they don't come super often. They come often enough, but not, not super often. So people kind of choose not to see the negative effects, but when they do embark on the basements, or as we now call money printing, which is the same thing, it's really, really bad for, uh, for the societies. And we have so many examples of this that I'm even interested in writing a second uh, money dethroned about the paper experiments instead. Because they, they are in a sense even worse than the, the metallic debasements and the metallic tinkering that people, that they were doing before. So these paper experiments, uh, I, I've been writing about two of them in my Tales of Soft Money. One was the, the Yon Law in the, I think he started in the end of the 17th, the end of the 17th century, can, can be. Yeah, Yon Law, he was uh, reorganizing the French monetary system. And then 100 years after, or approximately 100 years after, you have the Assignat experiment, where they, they also managed to destroy the whole economy of France, and people were put in abject poverty and starvation, and in the end, you know, guillotines. So I have written about two of these examples of uh, paper money and central banks making a complete mess. So it would be rather interesting to continue there to see how many, how many good examples can we find of, of actual total disaster of such paper money, because I think you can really screw up an economy much, much faster with central banks and paper money than you could as a, as a medieval monarch just trying to get some, some sil silver, some seniors from silver and gold. But, but to your, back to your question, I don't see any legitimacy. It's, um, no, I, I don't see it. While knowing, you know, I mean, I know I'm repeating myself a little sometimes, but it's this, it's so, it's so unbelievable when you, when you, when you know, when you understand that the members, all the members of the Bank of National Settle, all central bank, they are literally untouchable, politically untouchable, legally uh, not liable and criminally immune. And this is what I just, uh, you know, I wish, I, you know, we could, you know, better uh, make people comprehend or, I don't know, visualize uh, that the problem, I think, also is not only our generation, but our past generation, our parents and grandparents, they don't even know, they or didn't know what it was like or what it could have been like uh, on, a, on a hard money basis, whether it be gold standard. Or so. so sometimes <clears throat> I wonder, or maybe even Safed and Amus uh, wrote about this, like how could have, you know, artists like what, whoever, Michelangelo or um, like lived for such a long time. I mean, except maybe you, you know, married a, someone rich or you inherited a lot of money. But I think a uh, hundred years, a couple of hundred years ago, people were still able to save money to, to keep purchasing power. Um, so yeah. are we moving towards that again? Yeah, with Bitcoin, yes. With the uh, fiat money, no, you can't save, you can't really save. Um, I don't know many people that save a lot of money in, uh, in the state currencies. Mm -hmm. It's better to invest it, even if, 
let's say you, you don't know about Bitcoin, then it's it's even then better to just invest it on the stock market or buy a slightly more expensive property or whatever, because the the, the annual added money production it's not worth having just storing your wealth that way. Um, I want to I want to bring up one thing you talked about uh, the central banks. One thing that I think people underestimate is also that the dangers posing from central banks it doesn't always come from you know decisions by authority that tells the central bank to print money. This is always a big danger, of course. We we have certain such uh, you know feelings in Turkey where, for example, Erdogan can put pressure on the central bank to change the interest rate or increase the money production and such stuff. And in history, there has been other examples of where the order comes, print more money, we need the money. Mm -hmm. But one underappreciated danger, I think, is that the economists that work in central banks, many of their models, their mental models are wrong. So they are, they are perceiving sometimes a scarcity of money and an abundance of money. So I have read certain excerpts from um, the German central bank in the in the 1920s before the hyperinflation and the arguments they were putting forward why they were printing money that led to hyperinflation they were so extremely similar to many arguments to many false arguments that you see today about money that there is not enough money in circulation or there's not enough money to chase all the products and services it's kind of weird keynesian economic thinking that leads these central banks to to cause monetary disaster despite not getting an order from above print more money because you know when the order comes from above print more money that of course they can understand that this will end in disaster but we have a dictator and he tells us to do it um, so i see a danger also in central banks causing monetary disaster just by their own incompetence also not by any that they want to cause a disaster. So Bitcoin fixes that as well. It fixes uh, the threat that <clears throat> any party comes to power and orders the printing presses to go hot. And it also fixes their ability to, uh, because they're incompetent, these central bankers, that they print uh, because they're incompetent and that they think that it spurs the economy on or whatever. Now, uh, can we make a differentiation of whether, you know, however they inflate the money or, you know, debase the money, whether it's re literally printing money out of thin air or creating centralized digital fiat money or fractional reserve banking? Do you want to, like, make a differentiation, like how they create? <laughs> um, in general, maybe, uh... And maybe in connection with, the, you know, with this trend of the central banks with the intention to create a central bank digital currencies? Mm -hmm. No, the, the central bank, the, when you say central bank digital currencies, do you mean their uh, current the cryptocurrency experiments that they're pursuing or do you mean yeah. just in general? Okay. Yeah, yeah I for think... example, like China now, you know, talk about, or I mean, it's, it's it, at the end of the day, it's, it's centralized. It's a centralized yeah, digital ledger. Exactly. So it's just the, yeah. uh, it's just a mirage. It's a waste of time from their part because they already have centralized money and they can already manage the money. So if they create these uh, fake cryptocurrencies and they, I think uh, Sweden is pursuing such a project, for example, Eakrona, uh, they will still be in power to change it. They can change the supply, they can change, they can uh, censor transactions and so on. And since the monetary systems are already digitalized, I, I don't see a point, but on the other hand, I haven't researched the subject because it doesn't interest me. I don't see that they can. For me, it's just uh, the same kind of state currency as usual. It's, it was already digitized before and it will be digitized. And they, if they want to call it cryptocurrency, that's fine, but it, it will not be like Bitcoin, of course. Mm -hmm. What about the, um, how, how strong is the circulation of, of, of paper money or cash? in your country like because there are some countries you know that people are really uh you know uh, adamantly uh, uh, totally keen on, on using still you know cash like germany i think one of the few countries that uh, yeah. there's a high circulation what about in your country in sweden no cash is very uncommon i uh, 
no, people don't use cash. We have most people have an app. It's called Swish. You can uh, swish money to each other, and it settles instantly. So it's it's rather good that way. And when you pay in the stores and so on, people don't use uh, paper money. There was some law coming recently that the banks are they are forced to provide paper uh, currency to especially the older part of the population that wants it. But the general trend has for a long time been uh, uh, to go digitized. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me, I don't mind. I see the structural problem, of course. It, it is uh, much easier for uh, future totalitarian forces to control the economy if everything is digitized, to, uh, to shut down certain uh, money sh uh, channels, whatever. But now we have Bitcoin as well. so. I, I, I use my my Visa card happily. I don't care. I have Bitcoin also. So. Right. right. Where, where do you think uh, is this process going with um, negative rate interest policy and everything is going on uh, globally right now? Do you see like an end? <laughs> how how long can 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 they blow up this this uh, you know balloon? You know, I I have focused. Uh, lately now on uh, on the metallic debasements and the, the 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 primitive monies so i wouldn't consider myself an expert on the on the modern system enough to have a strong opinion on that i, I think it looks super weird of course with negative interest rates it's there's some, something wrong obviously at the same time the monetary system now it's so complicated so it takes a lot of time to really become an expert in it i wish i could uh, I wish I could uh, research more about it, and maybe I will in the future. But right now, I just stay away from from, from that. I don't uh, dabble with it investment-wise or, or anything. I keep gotcha. the bit and uh, I, I don't have any trust in that these guys know what they are doing when they are uh, putting negative interest rates and whatever, because their economic models are flawed from the very beginning. So I think they for sure will screw up. In one way or another. So, Emil, um, what do you think? Um, um, why do you think a, a lot of old I call them old school macro investors, or you know, from the old traditional finance world? I mean, they're getting it. So I think gradually, it's uh, you know, slowly but gradually, they're getting it. But what, what do you think are the the main reasons, or the obstacles, or bias, or what are the reasons that you know, they're still extremely, I mean, it's beyond conservative. It's just not, just doesn't mm -hmm. like even Ray Dalio, you know, people like Warren Buffett, and forget Warren Buffett, but you know, like, like uh, reasonable macro investors. Do you think, do you have the feeling they're opening up for Bitcoin? I think they're slowly opening up. Uh, I do. But I think the general conservatism stems mainly from uh, the economic education, which tells that you know, state money is the, we only learn about state money and we, uh, you, you never discuss free market money in, in the universities. And inflation is seen as something good in university. You learn about it. If you increase the inflation, the, the unemployment reaches zero in them. All these, these flawed models. But I also think, think it's a, a heuristic that anything new, this old conservative, managers they might have seen a lot of this economic tinkering and uh, experimentation before which has failed and they have just a heuristic that no i don't want to be a part of that i have seen such such things fail before this uh, this time it's different thinking or uh, uh, we find we found we have found a new solution to uh, to the world's ills and, like they, they are very skeptical against this kind of revolutionary solutions and i think as with many things if they just studied more if they studied the fundamentals then of course they warm up to bitcoin because the fundamentals are really good it's not based on hope bitcoin will only survive if the fundamentals are are very good i think we'll see a gradual that they will gradually embrace bitcoin more and more maybe start to dabble a little bit and save it through vehicles like uh, exchange traded notes uh, and various instruments on, on the exchanges. And in then, who knows, maybe more and more will buy real Bitcoin as well. But it takes time. 
I remember I was very skeptical the first time I heard about it. It was in the middle of uh, my education in university. Mm-hmm. I saw this, uh, this uh, astronomical rise and then the crash because uh, Mount Gox got hacked. And I was thinking, what, what idiots, you know, <laughs> they have money that can be hacked. But then when you read about Bitcoin, you, you understand that back then people didn't even understand the distinction between an exchange getting hacked and the, the Bitcoin code base getting hacked. Mm-hmm. So exactly. I understand that people are skeptical, but this kind of monetization process, that usually takes time. The same with demonetization processes. Like many monies that I was writing about in Money Dethroned, it took hundreds of years for them to be dethroned, even though they were worthless as money. Like uh, you have the, the glass beads in Western Africa, for example, one bead was actually worth its weight in gold mm-hmm. for a long time. Um, it took many, many years and many ships full of uh, beads to actually cause them to be demonetized in them. And so, uh, Emil, uh, and didn't it take like hundreds of years till people were conditioned or, you know, had to be conditioned to, to accept paper money instead of hard money, whatever hard money, you know, whether it be silver, gold, or it wasn't that like a gradual thing that like, like people literally had to be convinced of, like, this is sort of in lieu of, you know, mm, I think so. As I said, I haven't, uh... I haven't started studying, studying the, the period in detail yet. What mm-hmm. happened when it was, my book ends with gold. Gold emerged victorious as money. So the next step, which you brings up now, it's obviously that to secure the gold, you don't want to keep it at your home at all times, especially when you're out traveling. So you hand it in to, to goldsmiths who have safe vaults, for example, and they give you a receipt that you have the gold at, at them. And from there, the paper money revolution started, you can, you can argue. Um, paper represented the gold in the beginning and then it, over time it became disconnected or a note did, not, did no longer represent the same amount of gold in the vault because you did not have control over your physical gold. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it, that was a, it was a natural um, result stemming from the properties of gold that you can't safely store it yourself. And this is something that Bitcoin deals with as well. If you have your full node, you have a hardware wallet, for example, especially if you diversify with the hardware wallets, you can consider yourself very safe. Um, you don't have to hand in your Bitcoin to anyone else. Right. And additionally, you know, with all the, all the security measures like multi-seek and yeah. You know, yeah. So uh, I want to ask you uh, to wrap this up. Uh, talk. Uh, you've heard of Jack Muller's strike uh, development or app or whatever piece he just released, sort of as a beta or whatever phase, and uh, you know it could literally uh, red pill a lot of people without it having even the people, uh, you know, average person think about Bitcoin. If they want to pay with fiat, they can go to the merchant, and the merchant, if if they let's say the merchant has a BTC pay server and all it needs is the app is of course, again, cause you know, it comes to, you know, to the need to talk about custody and surveillance then, but it, it is, it is connected to a bank account, to debit card. Mm-hmm. Um, what I'm trying to say is, can we put this whole shit coinery attack discussions to rest? Because, you know, it's like, oh, BTC, Bitcoin is not a payment. A technology and and then you know the bitcoin realists or maximalists say oh it's a savings technology so maybe maybe it's, it has a purpose why it takes this time it takes this gradual process to make it from a store of value or savings technology to a medium of exchange or payment technology what, what does it do to to the whole ecosystem to the whole you know bitcoin space mm-hmm. I, I haven't checked in detail uh, Jack's work on this. I have listened to him before. I really like what he's doing, but I will, I will check out his latest software. But one thing that I like to view the Lightning Network, the, the Lightning Network applications in, uh, in the framework of what I'm doing with, with uh, Austin Economics, hard money and so on. We have talked about saleableness and saleability. <clears throat> if many people use Bitcoin layer one, you know, the fees uh, rise astron- astronomically. It's very difficult to use it uh, with low cost. So this is an example of where saleableness of Bitcoin decreases when everyone is using it a lot. So what then Lightning Network is doing 
it's that it offsets this decrease in saleableness. So if guys like Jack are pushing out really great solutions, it helps Bitcoin extraordinarily much because it increases again the saleableness of Bitcoin. It lowers the cost of transacting with Bitcoin. So if the cost decreases, it will be used more for you know, payments, transactions in the future. Now, if the costs are high, people choose to they choose not to buy frivolous things with Bitcoin. They choose to just save it instead. So I'm pretty optimistic about Lightning Network and that it increases. It will increase the number of transaction, possible transactions quite considerably and that itself increases the saleableness of Bitcoin. So it's, it's really good from even from an uh, Austrian economist point of view. Right. Uh, I just find it, you know, uh, um, if we could just find a solution to the problem of this on and off ramp, because yeah, I mean, if the, if the strike app of Jack Muller's is, is still connected, right? It's, it's, it's connected to the fiat world. So what kind of technical regulatory yeah. obstacles there is, I don't know. So it's, we, we, we shall see, but at least, you know, people, uh, they can pay in fiat. They don't, you know, they don't have to go to seven, 17 steps and <laughs> set up mm-hmm. a wallet and do this and do that. And I mean, it's crazy. It's overwhelming. So, uh, but it's good for the merchant. I mean, the yeah, only I mean, thing, yeah, it's like in between process, you know, how do we get rid of this, uh, you know, fiat ramp on and off? Exactly. It's, it's good that new people can try out than, uh, than Bitcoin. They will learn more about Bitcoin and so on. And these things, even if they are connected to the fiat system, it, it means that it's a, it is a central point of failure if the state gets very aggressive in the future. But, you know, meanwhile, I, I don't have anything against making, uh, such processes easier now for example an etf is one example of the state in the future can shut it down of course if they want to but meanwhile it can give people a lot of utility to be able to uh, easily funnel some money into an etf for example so even though various various developments are connected to the fee to the the old monetary system if you will it doesn't make them bad. I, I'm, I'm not this. Uh, I'm not an extremist in the, in the sense that we shouldn't touch. We shouldn't touch the old system, or we should all. Uh, I don't know how, how to best explain it. Like, it, it is. It is okay to use these custodial versions if you do it properly. If you don't put all your your uh, savings there, for example, and if you do it with care, if you judge which company is providing the custody, custodian, uh, the custody. So that's totally fine. I, I can take one example. Here in Sweden, we have um, there's tax benefits to allocate some resources to Bitcoin through an exchange traded note. You pay virtually no tax, even if it goes up in value. So then there's a it's a trade off. Either I, I have a better security and better risk management if I keep the Bitcoin myself, or I entrust this uh, the issuer of the exchange traded notes that they will handle it with multisigs and so on, that they hire good consultants <clears throat> and that uh, I don't pay tax uh, when it goes up. So it's a, it's a trade-off. You don't have to choose either or, I think. Right. So uh, final question, Emil, um, what do you think uh, could be, I mean, besides, you know, the halvings coming next, whatever, April, May, 2020, um, and then, the halving after that, 2024. Um, are there any other, um, you know, events, macroeconomical or uh, un, unexpected um, things that could happen that that would, uh, you know, usher into a blossoming of, of Bitcoin, <laughs> and make it really like unexpectedly go to, you know, liquidity and market cap of trillions? You know, I don't know about blossoming, <clears throat> but for sure, I want to see the effects that the halving have. <clears throat> it will be super interesting, especially since everyone wants to debate it on Twitter. But I also want to see how Bitcoin reacts to uh, a financial crisis because we haven't really seen it. I have some friends who have, they don't own Bitcoin and they have been rather skeptical because they think Bitcoin will crash in the future if there is a crisis. Um, and what, whatever whatever it will be in, in the next uh, crisis of course it's nothing that you should hope for that that economists are are this 
that yeah that, that they're destroyed but i want to see what happens how uh, what what the price uh, what the bitcoin price will turn out to be right that, that will be uh, an interesting uh, add information fascinating okay, look. so um i can only uh, call upon my listeners your book is now available on amazon do you add any resources or links or anything you want to direct uh my listeners to her they can uh, they can go to twitter follow me mm-hmm. i'm uh, besant denier or just uh, search for emil sunstead i guess you can put some some link in also mm-hmm. they will find uh, a pinned thread where they can find my book and as i said uh, in this talk my book is about it's about the emergence of money and it's about primitive money and then about metallic money and all the kinds of screw ups that were imposed on all these monies so i think it's the, it's a historical journey as it's called in the title but i still think it's relevant for bitcoiners to understand what has happened to money historically not only the shitty fiat experiments that we have seen failed over and over but i also think it's kind of important to understand why even hard silver and gold got uh, people owning hard silver and gold got fleeced historically because yeah. uh, it can help us resist uh, the state in the future yeah I, f- I find it fundamentally important to understand that, that this this pattern <laughs> that you can constantly see you know and i think it's time to really comprehend and learn and and really take action because of those consequences that we've learned out of those so yeah so thanks so much emil for sharing your knowledge and uh uh, glad thank to... you, Kevin. Oh, by the way, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be in Vietnam in Hanoi. You would you would be a perfect fit for this for this conference. In it's a, it's a Eric's uh, conference, yeah. yeah? Eric Vosco, oh, yeah. yeah. Cool. I will follow. I hope they have a live stream or something. It will be really interesting. Yeah, I'm gonna do a series of interviews with all the speakers. Going to be great speakers. So you would you know make a really a perfect complementary addition to to this whole. It's you know basically fundamentally it's about economical uh, you know mm. uh, aspects of of Bitcoin and uh, technical, maybe to a limited degree. So yeah, thanks so much and hope to get you back soon. All right. Yeah, thank you so much, Kevin. And uh, I would love to be back another time in the future. All right, All right. Okay. take care. Bye-bye. All right, what do you guys think? Um, really enjoy, I always enjoy my talks with Emil um sunstead so make sure you check out his book or purchase it uh support his work uh, his website is bdratings.org or follow him on twitter Bezant denier is his twitter handle i'm going to put this all in show notes and money dethrone the historical journey all right uh i would really appreciate if you leave a positive review share it like it review it retweet it whatever you do you support me in any shape or form and I would also really welcome ethical sponsors because I want to go write, you know, uh, personal face-to-face talks. I want to go to the conferences or go to those countries where these events or the experts and the uh, uh, Bitcoiners are, you know, giving speeches or whatever or um, doing talks, presentations. So I can deliver you high-quality content uh, interviews and, and shows. And, yeah, and thank you so much again for everything. and. Talk to you soon. Bye. Total Bitcoin.